Hey YouTubers, the next uncut music interview up for you is Peter Noon, better known as Peter Noon of the Herman's Hermits. So 60s band with Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, and There's a Kind of Hush, and Silhouettes, and all those songs. Anyway, he grew up right around the Beatles invasion, British invasion, all the other super groups that came out of England at the time, and he has some great stories. One thing that struck me about him is Typically, we're on a, a junket, a press junket, when you do these interviews. So, like, they'll have several crews, and that per, one person will do several interviews throughout the day. So, I thought, okay, we only probably got 20 minutes with him or something. And we got in there, and he just kept talking and talking. It was awesome. Tell more and more stories. You can kind of, about three quarters of the way through, you can feel like I'm trying to wrap it up to let him go, thinking, you know, he has uh, other stuff to do. I'm taking too much of his time. And he just keeps coming up with funny, funny stories. And uh, so he was a great, great interview. One of the best I've ever experienced. I'm a big 60s music fan, so hopefully you'll enjoy this. Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits. Am I, shall I, uh, oh, but if I can't get up much higher, I have to hold there my stomach in right all there. the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, we're good. What do you think you're best known for? He, you know, quite strangely enough, as years have gone, I've been known for many different things. This month, Many people recognize me from being in Married with Children because it seems to be on all the time. Kids come up to you on the street and say, are you the guy from Married with Children? Which is really bizarre because it's, I was only in it once, but I had the best line in the show, which was, um, oh, you're Axel. I got one of your records, the one that sold. <laughs> which I think is the funniest line in, you know, because it must be the worst thing to be a one-hit wonder, except that's much better than making records that were not hits at all. But to be a one-hit wonder is like really an insult. So I enjoyed that line, and kids saw that I enjoyed delivering it. And before that, the other night I got recognized as, as the, oh, you're the man from As the World Turns. That's my favorite soap. Oh, you are British. So I thought it was kind of the waitress didn't know that, she thought that the person I was playing was actually pretending to be British. Oh, you really are British. Yeah. Really so um, that was kind of weird because I, I don't look like um, I don't look like a normal person. Do you know what I mean? I don't fit in if I walk out in the street. I'm obviously like not I have a different haircut than all the other guys and stuff. So anyway, she recognized me. And before that, a lot of people recognized me from my generation. You're like people under 30 go, you're the guy from my generation because that was a big show for a long time. And then before that, it's their moms who go, you look like that guy from Herman's Hermits, only older. <laughs> Funny how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was with these guys. I'm, I'm kind of fortunate because my, my career was really a music career. And music is, is invisible, you know. And you can only remember bits of it. Like you can remember Herman's Hermits on the Ed Sullivan show and stuff like that. Because my daughter's 15. And when she met the people from the Monkees... She was in shock because she thought they would look like they looked in 1968 because she'd recently seen them on television in something from then. I'm lucky that I've got, like, recent stuff so they're not in complete shock when they see me. Oh, my God! They go, oh, he only looks about 10 years older than he did 10 years ago when he did that TV show. <laughs> How often do you go on tour? I, I did 207 days last year which is a lot. And this year, I think I'm going to do about 150. You know what happened? Herman's Hermit suddenly got a big shot. You know, it was worthwhile touring it, you know, because it was, it was obviously a missing... We hadn't ever done that many tours, you see. We did a lot in the 60s, and then we, dis, we disintegrated. So it was all put back together again, and um, there was obviously a reason to tour it because people wanted to see it, and we hadn't realised that, to tell you the truth, that there would be that much... And I think it's probably because all the other people from that period are, are dead or not lucid. <laughs> um, are, really, are you the only original member in the, as you toured now? Yeah, this is, this is the original member right here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I do have a screw-up one in my... No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the only... What happened was that we decided that the only reason home, what the vision was, you know, I'm sort of one of those like strange characters. I always have like a reason for doing things. And the idea was we wanted it to be home and summits as if we'd just picked up from where we stopped in 1973. So I wanted all the guys to be 30 ish like we were then. And I would pretend to be. See, when I was in home and summits when I was 22, I was pretending to be younger. 
because the songs were, you know, Mrs. Brown, You Got a Lovely Daughter is a song by a 14-year-old person. So even now I have to, now I'm knocking 40 years off. I was only knocking three and four off at the time. It was easier. But I wanted the band to visually look like it would if we'd carried on in 1973, not as if we'd worked for 30 years, you know, in holiday inns and little bars in Arizona and be like, Ugh. I wanted to look nice and fresh as if we were just, so every, all the band wear suits. Some of the original hermits, the ones who are alive, wouldn't look good in these suits, too small. <laughs> uh, why do you think 60s music has held up so well? I mean, as, as a genre, because even like the 70s kind of get passed mm -hmm. over. You know, the 80s are novelty, new wave-ish comeback, but 60s music is always, and it holds up. I think the 60s music probably is still around because it appears, it's actually apparent that there's more to it than meets the eye. You know, there was a lot of stuff going on. There was a cultural revolution and a musical revolution. It was when, it was when musicians were first given the keys to the office, you know what I mean? The Beatles actually did it, you know, without them. Even though they didn't realize they were doing it, they, they created an independent atmosphere. And it, and it goes around, it's cyclical show business, you know, it just keeps coming back to that part one again. Well, they, Herman's Hermits couldn't have existed if it wasn't for the Beatles because they created the idea of independently choosing which songs you recorded. See, if, we, if Herman's Hermits had have come before them, we would have been in the studio when we were 11, but we wouldn't have been allowed to record Mrs. Brown, You Got a Lovely Daughter, or Henry VIII, or any of those, because the A&R men would say, that's not a hit. It has to be this pullover that you gave to me, do up, do up, and we didn't do that. The Beatles didn't do it, and they created, and of course, the other independent band at the time was the Rolling Stones. So the three biggest bands from like 1964, 65 were the Beatles, the Stones, Herman Hermits, and the Dave Clark Five. And interestingly enough, none of them were signed to a label where they had to do what the label said. We were all allowed to do our own stuff. And that was the beginning of that. See, since Frank Sinatra said, well, I'll do it once, there'd been this whole bit where the record business had been taken over, like the last 10 years, by people who designed what you did in the studio. The 50s was like that, you know. They would get the coasters, you sing this part, you sing this part. The co coaster didn't come with, we got this great song, let's record it. Doc and the other guy wrote this song, did the track and said, right, you sing this, you sing, I'll show you what to sing. Well, Beatles were having nothing to do with that. I couldn't sing like anybody that I wanted to sing like, so I had to sing like me. I couldn't do rhythm and blues because I couldn't do that kind of music. I did romantic songs because that was the thing that I had going. And the Beatles came and they said, we write our own songs. They were offered, how do you, uh, how do you do what you do? It's a beautiful song. It would have been a hit, but it was a hit. My dad would have recorded it, it would have been a hit. Well, they said, no, we write our own songs. That sort of, you know, it's like Castle's wife saying, the cubes aren't doing well, get back to the blue, we'll pay some more taxes. <laughs> you know, and it didn't, you know, the Beatles completely opened that thing. So the 60s is really all the, all this energy was pent up and trapped because everybody had to, I know the people who were there before the Beatles, the Billy Furies and the Cliff Richards and all that. They were all designed, great performers, not, nothing to do, but that's the way they approach the business. We'll go there, somebody, Nori Paramore will write the song, and we'll do it, and it'll be a hit. Well, that, that changed. And of course, every band, somebody says, well, did you know any people from any bands? I can't remember anybody in the street that I grew up in who didn't have a connection to a band. Either the dad was the manager, the, the drummer was, you know, the son was a drummer or the girl went out with one of the, the foremost or one of the Beatles. It was just that kind of thing. Everybody was in on it. And I'm sure it was like that in America for a period then. Everybody had a guitar and a collection and knew somebody who was in a band. Right. And before that, it was some guy from Philly who had that strange hair, that Bobby Sherman hair. Ooh, do, 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 do. Everybody knew him. They still know him. But you see what I mean? And then suddenly it was like, it became the people's music. The Beatles opened it up for anybody who had a good idea could actually make a record. Before then, you had to know Nori somebody, and it really was not what you know, but who you knew. English show business. Beatles just plowed that all into the ground forever. It took a long time for it for, to allow those people back into the business. They're all back in the business. They all, their children came and took it back, you know what I mean? But for a long time it was like, until, that's what's it's a great moment to rock and roll. It would be the Beatles' arrival, 
in my lifetime. Before that, it would be Elvis and Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole, whatever went before. But in my lifetime, it would be the Beatles, the Sex Pistols, um, Spice Girls, because they got young girls back in the record stores for the first time since the 63, 64. They got teenage girls back in record stores, so they're important. And then probably Nirvana, you know, because it was independent and it was, we don't care that this nut's not going to get on the radio, we're just going to do that. Now we're waiting for the next one. And it would be five in, in 30 something years. It's not a lot, is it? When you think music has got so much input. And, and the record companies are all going, we don't know what's wrong, nobody's buying records. Well, there aren't any records that people want to buy. That's the same, it's, 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 if it's not raining, people don't buy umbrellas either. So the record companies are missing the fact that whatever's going to happen, they'll be the last to know. Yeah. It's going to be in some bar, isn't it, in, in Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. There's a band right now writing a song in Poughkeepsie that will be the one that changes the whole direction of it all. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Whatever happened to Dave Clark 5? Talk about out of sight. Yeah, it's kind of odd, isn't it? They're friends of mine. I mean, they've, it was a brilliant career, wasn't it? Yeah. They, they got involved in other stuff. Oh, and just left the music? Yeah, Dave produced a couple of really good shows, Broadway kind of shows in England, and um, they, they became wealthy. You know, Mike, is, uh, Mike, who was the singer, does all those, like, uh, you know, those commercials that you hear on the television in England all the time. You go, wow, that's a great commercial. Who's that? Mike Smith. And Dave's into all kinds of other stuff. Dave was always the businessman. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, just never hearing it on all the oldie circuits or anything like that. Well, you see, the, the people who are on the circuits are the people who thought they were great businessmen and tried to save money with the IRS. It's called the tax exiles and tax, you know. In this building, there's a whole office of people who protect people in show business from uh, making mistakes with their, like, trying not to pay taxes. See, because you get, it's easy with an entertainer, an entertainer or, a, or an author or something like that, because you go, you're going to make all this money in three years. Then you won't make any money anymore. So we're going to shelter you from taxes. And of course, all entertainers buy it because they're 16. Oh, that's true. They also buy I Love You. Oh, no, that's just the girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, you kind of went into a little bit, but uh, can oh. you describe the era in like the, the late 60s around swing in London or whatever they called it at that time? What, was the, hmm. what were the times like? Well, London in the 60s was astonishing. My thing was I was kind of a little bit too young to actually participate, so it's even better not to be in it because you can just watch it all go down. I mean, I used to go... I, I was fortunate because I was in a rock and roll band. I was in a band that kind of appeared significant to other people, not just to my mom. And uh, so I would do TV shows, and we had lots of hits. So, and I was 16, and, and when you're 16, you have huge amounts of nerve. And I would see the Beatles on a TV show that I was on as well, and I would say, where are you guys going tonight? Which, now I would never have the nerve to say that, you know. And they would go, oh, we're going back to London. I said, well, can I come with you? Because my guys are all going home to their mums, and I'd rather do something fun. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> and then they'd have this sort of, lose a 16 year old like with they were with 21 year old girls and there's nothing worse when you've got 21 year old dates to have like a 16 year old guy sitting there going and that was me but because of that i got to go everywhere like john lennon my parents allowed me to drink when i was little because we would travel to germany and so drinking was never a big deal to my family but it was a lot to people in england at that time so but i would go with john lennon and we go to the ad lib and it was it was great, the ad-lib was in London, it was the in place for a while there. You know, everyone had about a year. And you would get in this elevator, and it was, in, it was off Trafalgar Square, and you'd get in this elevator, and they would play like, I'm in with the in crowd, and the door would open. And I'm standing with one of the Beatles, and all these babes would go, like, I'm invisible, you know. I'm invisible, I'm with him, but not one set of eyes is on me, they're all like... <laughs> but I was with him, you see, so I got a little bit of the energy, I was like... Is this your brother? No, no, I don't know who he is, you know. So, but I was there, and you would hear all the greatest music played louder than you, your parents ever allowed you to play it. And there were all these girls in miniskirts and guys from other bands, and we'd meet the Four Tops because one of the Beatles. If you want to meet the Four Tops, hang out with one of the Beatles. Everybody wants to meet them. You become invisible. I was the invisible man. 
My cell phone never used to ring in those days. Oh, though. go ahead. Because I didn't have Pause one. for a sec. Probably Bobby Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> I had so much fun. I feel the vibe. Yeah. Love there? I got some new songs to try out on you. All right. I think we, well, we were leaving okay. up there. So at that time, obviously, you were a kid in a candy store because you were a lot younger than the... Yeah. And, and because I was kind of a kid and I was, I was in on all the, the scene was going on and everybody who had a hit record would meet at Top of the Pops every Thursday because if you were in the charts and it, it the? if you were in the charts, everybody who was in the charts went and did this TV show in England. So you would meet the Stones, the Beatles, the Kinks, the Hermans, Hermits, everybody, the Who, everybody who had a record in the charts would be constantly running into each other. And there was this an extraordinary amount of camaraderie which had never happened, it's never happened in America, but probably happened during the big band era when guys would be around in buses and they would meet and they would all have a beer together. There was this extraordinary amount of musical camaraderie where we were none of us competing for the same space. We were like plumbers in a union and we were all on this convention that was taking us to an American town and, and you would meet people from other bands. So, and there were stories that we could tell, you know, we just worked in Chicago, we worked for Ed Pazda, we got paid, did you get, you know, there was this amazing thing, which I've tried to carry on. And, and, you know, I would see the Stones and I'd say, those guys look interesting. And we had the same publicist as them. Their manager at the time was Andrew Oldham, and he was ours. And he was trying to design Herman Sermits to be the opposite of the Stones, which is perfect, because we really were. Except we were kind of the same. They were grammar school twits, and we were grammar school twits. And... You know, their idea at the time was they would do the Aldous Huxley Brave New World and Herman Summits would be this, the band that you would want your sister to date, right? Well, that was perfect for us. And um, it was perfect for us. We didn't need to be designed. We didn't have to do any work. You know, I think Mick Jagger had to do some work on becoming, like, less in intellectual. He had to pretend to be less intelligent. Than well, no. I mean, still does it. Now, you see an interview with him and he's very eloquent, very well educated. Yes, 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 sir. I talked to you later, doctor. Hello there, darling. You know, I mean, it's like two completely different... Well, I was allowed... Herman became Peter Newman, became Herman. You know what I mean? I was lucky, because I refused to get into that Stanislavski all-day stuff. And um, there was this great... I hung out with the Stones, and they were completely different types of people than the Beatles. You know, and I would... They, I'd get a, I'd hitch a right... Where are you going? You know, that was my thing. Where are you going tonight, lads? You know, it's like I'm from the north of England. It's like being from the south in America. How y'all doing? I was him. Where are you going tonight? And they say, well, we're going back to London because we live there. Oh, I'm going to London. Could I get a ride with you guys? Because my lads are all going home to their mums. It was my thing, you see. It was kind of putting down my lads. They go home to the mums. I don't need... I'm, my mum's like history. My mum has a job. She goes to work. And um, they, I would get in their car and they had an American car and they had this mad guy called Reg King who would drive along and he would lean out of the window of this car and tap people's wing mirrors off their things, which I thought was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. This is great. And thoughtless for the poor old lady who was driving along the freeway in England. My wing mirror! Oh, God! Those stones! <laughs> and he was called Reg King. He's famous, this guy. And he was their driver, and this was like, wow! And they knew birds like no one. And my luck was that I wasn't into the drug and the drinky scene, you see, because... I'd seen all that at home. My dad was in a band and all those guys smoking reefer had like been, ah. So, you know, so, and I knew from my dad's theme was that if you hung with the guys who did the drugs, when they would go into the other room to discuss the meaning of life and stuff like that, they would always leave their girlfriends. And that's where I was, in the other room, like, hello, where are you from? I'm from Scarborough, I've been there. And that was my thing. They were all doing the drugs and the drinking and the dancing all night long, and I was chatting up their girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was it like? Do you remember the time when you kind of made that first U.S. invasion or when you guys Ooh, became yeah. popular enough to come over? Well, we thought we were popular the first time we came over. It's only when we got here we realised that it wasn't really that big a deal. We thought that the British invasion had already happened, but it was kind of in motion. And we arrived in New York and they made a big deal out of, it, out of it, you know, in New York and everything. But then the tour began in, like, San Antonio, Texas or something, you know. And we realized how big America was and a station wagon wasn't really comfortable for seven people with all the equipment. And we had to learn the hard way. But by the time we got back to the East Coast, it had suddenly exploded. You know, during the first tour, 
we were very naive and we agreed with, with Dick Clark came to us. He was way ahead of the, the British invasion game. And he said, we'll have a British band on every one of our tours. And we were on the Little Anthony Imperials, Ike and Tina Turner and the Iquettes. Everybody that we'd ever heard of when we grew up was on this tour. And we were special guests from, the UK, from England, uh, Herman's Hermits, with an I in Herman, Herman's Hermits. And by the end of that tour, they'd moved it from these high schools and like gymnasiums into arenas because it was now home and so it's with special guests like and Tina Turner. You know, during that tour, we suddenly had three records. But at the beginning of the tour, we were unknown. And then Mrs. Brown, who got a lovely daughter, came out. And there were three records in the top 10 or top 15 by the time the third week of the tour. And we were on a bus. And we said, you know, we, we've got three records and it's just, we, we should get back in the station wagon. There was more room because there were like 50 people on this bus. <laughs> and we used to sleep in the baggage compartments. It wasn't a bus like they got now where there were all beds and everything. It was a bus like... <laughs> but we met all these wonderful people. We met Anthony and the Imperials. Because we didn't know black people. We knew all about black music, but we had no... You know, I went to school with a guy called Woods who was Indian. He was His parents were India. That was the closest we'd ever got to, to black people. So we came to America and we were thrown right in and we met all these phenomenal characters. We'd grown up with their music and we had no idea that they really had this whole new thing. So for Herman's Hermits, we started to discover, on our first tour of America, we discovered, we learned more in that first hundred days in this bus from these guys about how to act and how to cr be creative in the music business than we could have learned in 500 years in England. Same thing happened to the Beatles as well. They came over here and they suddenly said, oh, whoa, here is the home of the music. Yeah. Right. It's all on this bus. And the Stones are right to go to Chicago exactly. and chase the blues around. Yeah, exactly. That must have been fun. Yeah, well, we, we were lucky because we were with pop people. You know, Teddy Randazzo wrote those things for, uh, for Anthony and the Imperials. It just used their voice and their style to make those beautiful songs. Okay? Mm -hmm. We learned a lot. And Billy Stewart was on the bus as well. The, the thing was to try and not get the seat. If you got up early enough, you would make sure you didn't get a seat next to Billy Stewart because he weighed 460 pounds. And there was another guy called Round Robin who weighed 390. And the idea was if you were really smart, you would get on the bus before they came on. And, and I remember that we, we were on this tour and it was, a one, it was a great experience. The best people, the best person to sit next to was Little Anthony, because he was little, and I was little. <laughs> they called him Little Anthony because he was little. So he was a good person to sit next to. <laughs> and Ike was very skinny as well. <laughs> <laughs> as long as he didn't hit you. No, never mind. Uh... No, he only hits women. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um... During that era, too, all the British, uh, American people at least, always wonder why British bands don't sing with a British accent. They sing with an American accent, mm -hmm. and most all the British bands at that time did, except you. Why is that? Well, Herman was desperately trying to be different, remember, because I chose a name that didn't fit. The idea of Herman Summits is still kind of a bit preposterous, but the idea was we'd see, I would sit there and I would look at these bands like the Beatles and go, oh my God. There's no way, I can't, I don't even know 50 guys who could play as good as Paul McCartney. So what we've got to do is be odd. We can't be writing our songs because I could never write a song as good as Please Please Me or Love Me Do or Pete. Not, not that they were the best ones, but at the time they were still a million times better than my songs. And um, we designed a band. That's why we got the name Herman because we figured that no girl would ever scream at a man called Herman. And I would dress in, we were kind of an odd band, you know, we'd play The Cabin and we'd open with My Boy Lollipop, which is a strange song for a guy called Herman to be singing. But the only people who got it were people that I was impressed with. You know, the, for example, John Lennon was my brother-in-law's friend, best friend, and he would be impressed that this band were doing songs like My Boy Lollipop. We didn't do it well even, but at least we did it. And we'd do Mrs. Brown, You Got a Lovely Daughter, and I'd dress up in a school uniform. And I would dress up as a Jamaican lady to do my boy lollipop because that was by Millie Small. And I would do all this stuff that was kind of odd. You know, it was odd to sing mother-in-law. When you're 14, the worst, the devil should be her, Satan is her other name, is not stuff that people could, at the cavern, most of the audience would just dance while we'd do all this odd stuff, you know. But the people that I was in, wanted to impress were impressed, which were the labels, other bands, 
You know, I didn't care about the audience that much. You wanted Maggie Woods to think you were cute, but you didn't care about any of the guys in the audience. And John Lennon once said to me, don't worry about the people who like you in the audience. You should be working for the people who hate you. That was a great one. <laughs> Forget the fan club. Work at those guys at the back who want to thump you. And that was what the Beatles did. He said it was played over. Oh, God. Pause for station identity. Yeah, we should oh, you want switch tape. tape. Change tape? Well, you never did answer the question. Which Why? one? Why uh, <laughs> why did you sing with a British accent and oh. no one else was at that time? The reason I sang with a British accent was, was because nobody else did. And, and it just seemed... It always seemed to me a bit odd that all these English people were singing with, with American accents and doing it. We all do it very well, you know. And I go, well, you know... I'm going to switch it off. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's telling you've got a voicemail then. Right. Okay, it's off now. I'm sorry, I forgot to switch it off last time. The reason I sang with a British accent was because most of the work that we were doing was odd. And to make it more... A little known fact about all those accents on those, on those Herman Summit records is they're all different accents. When I sang Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter, I was singing it as a person from Manchester. When I sang Herman's, uh, Henry VIII, I sang it as a person from London. When I sang Leaning on a Lamp Post, I was singing it as a person from Yorkshire. And they're all as different as people from New York, L.A. and Arkansas to English people. Mm -hmm. But they all just sounded like an English accent. At the moment, I'm playing a British person on a soap. And I've created another accent for him. You know, it's just part of my... They were all different accents, and um, I thought that was very charming. You know, I wanted to be Tom Courtney singing Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter, and I wanted to be, because that was my thing. And it, and it helped me on stage, and it's still the same thing. People go, I can't believe you can still sing that when you, you know, Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. It should be Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely granddaughter or something. You know what I mean? This is good. It's illogical. But uh, you see, I'm not my age on stage. I'm always in somebody else's. It is Stanislavski. It is the method, you become the person, and, and it makes the songs very easy because they're over before you have time to think how ludicrous it might look. You only feel like an idiot when you watch the video. video. You go, oh, Jesus, I'm doing the Freddy. I can't do that, I'm old. <laughs> do the Freddy. I have that DVD of the British Invasion uh, oh dear. concert from PBS I yeah. that you guys are on. Freddy. Oh, poor old Freddy. Ooh, he's rough. But you know, he, he was, he's never works. That was his last show. Oh, really? You have his last show. What happened on the plane back from that? You know, he's old, Freddie. I used to joke, I made the joke in the show. I said, you know, it's good to be here doing these songs for the 60s. It's easy for Freddie because he's in his 60s. He was like 66. He got drunk on the plane. And you know what happens when you get drunk on the plane if you're old? They get hold of you and you, they take you to hospital and try and fix you up. If you're young and you're drunk, leave him and, you know, throw a bucket of water on him. They took him, tried to fix him up, and he, they made him much sicker than he was. And now he's in hospital. Mm. You know, he had like some sort of heart murmur or something, some valve that wasn't working. They fixed that, and bit by bit, they're fixing, you know, oh, he's got good insurance. Let's get a bit of this, chop this. So Freddie's not, that was his last show. Oh. Did I ever answer any of your questions? Yep, yep, okay. the accent was good. Okay, I can move into that. <laughs> Got one down then. Wasn't there? A, there was a year sometime when you sold more records than the Beatles. Sixty-five, we sold more records than the Beatles. Isn't that astonishing? I had no idea. Once I, you know, my my parents got cash box. We had no idea what was going on. Like I found out twenty years later that I was on the cover of Time magazine, but um, but we sold suddenly cash box, and I see my parents have it, and there's like an advert from the record company with a nice picture of me on my own, not the band, and it said. You know, Home and Summit sold more records 1965. We got a cash box award. My parents have it. You know, I never kept any of that stuff. But um, quite astonishing. And I think in 66 we did as well. But maybe the Beatles were in the studio making Abbey Road or something. You know, there's got to be so. One of their great acts, one of their great albums was being made probably. But at that time, weren't they doing like three albums a year? I mean, you guys cranked out music at that time so much more than they do today. Actually, what happened to us in 65 was that We'd made all these records for England. And when we'd go in the studio, we'd make things to see how they turned out. And if they weren't singles, they became album tracks. It's before people made albums. You didn't go in and make an album like uh, The Beatles. You know, you would go in and do your stage show on an album and it'd be Herman Summit's On the Road. 
you know, uh, introducing her. So, it's, so all these kind of odd songs that were part of our stage show had been sitting in this album. And when the American, when it came to America, the, la the radio stations would go, wow, that's how they did it. I mean, they took the next single off the album. So we had like three, we had one released every four weeks. You know, somebody would play Mrs. Brown, somebody would play Silhouette, somebody would play. So they started releasing all these singles. So I think we had 13 singles that year. So of course we sold more records than anybody else because we had all this backlog of great stuff that suddenly got thrown into the marketplace. Wow. It would have been nice if they'd kept them over 10 years. <laughs> but, but Herman Summers, you know, when we made the singles, it was a great time for music. And, and this might be why because you could go in the studio on a Monday and you could make a record and it would, you could be, have it in the stores on Thursday. And Mickey and I, who made the records, Mickey Most, who was a genius, I mean, he was able to know exactly what Herman Summits were up to all the time, even though we didn't know what we were doing. And we would go on Monday, we'd make a record, we'd say, we'd need a record about, for the summer, you know, Sunshine Girl and stuff like that, you know, sort of the beach and shh. And, you know, kids can do all that stuff, you know, we just, let's just do it. No, there was no negativity anywhere. And we would finish it and we'd stay up all night and we'd go next day to Hayes, EMI and Hayes. And Mickey would stand there as they cut the shellac or whatever it's called, you know, and we'd say, no, turn it up a little bit. Oh, you can't have it in those red. Why not? We want it in the red bit there, plus two. And we would stand there and they'd do it. So our records were like... And then we would take it and then begin to press it. And it would be in the stores on Thursday. And we'd call the radio station, we've got a new record, you want to hear, hear it first? You know, all that stuff. It was like, it's a small world. Now it's huge. You need to know 600 people before you can even get it. You need to have 600 people's emails address before you can even con con contemplate show business now. That must have been fun. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Do you ever get tired of playing some of the old favorites when you're out touring? I, I was lucky that I took a big period off. I took like 12 years off in the middle of my career and didn't go anywhere near Herman Sermit stuff. To the point that when I went back in 1986, I think it must have been 1980, around 1986, having not played them since 1973, was the last American tour, yeah, 73, 74, um, that I had to go and buy the records. I had to go and buy the records and I was seen not by Ike, but he heard about it. I, on Sunset, driving along Sunset with the window of my car open, singing along to Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. A pure sign, a true sign of insanity. You know who I just saw walking, driving along Sunset, playing his own records and singing? Not Brian Jones, not Brian Wilson, Peter Noon. See what I mean? <laughs> I'd forgotten them, you know, the second verse, of Henry it's VIII, the it's easy. Yeah. It, Henry VIII, but in Mrs. Brown there are different verses, and you better have them right because that audience know, you know, because they sing along. I'm going, is she right or am I right? <laughs> so you don't have a teleprompter on stage then? No, but I'm <laughs> sure that happens one day. <laughs> you know, I got five names. I have a lot of stuff to remember already. <laughs> uh, what is the one thing in your career you're most proud of? Uh, that I, I kept my sense of humor because a lot of people in show business take it way too seriously. A lot of people. And I think the fact that I was able to be, have a sense of humor about how important the whole thing is, because it really isn't. I always say the same thing when we were, nurses, nurses do the real work. And people show up and they give them a baby that's fallen out of a car or been hit by a truck or something and say, please, well, what we do is just sort of deliver like, <laughs> No matter who it is, every form of entertainment is to, is to take people's heads away from the real stuff of life. You know, and it's unfortunate, I think, for the music business that, that as much as we all enjoy the, don, the, 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 the Bob Dylan, the, the Woody thing that got into show business, before that it was probably a little bit, set em up, Joe, is a better theme, I think, than you're on the eve of destruction, which was proved wrong. We weren't on the eve of destruction. We can sing it today and it's still, one day, one day they'll be right, just like every prophecy. I think it's a better idea there's a kind of hush all over the world, people are falling in love, because there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world. And I don't think we need to be reminded about it outside of the news and when we need to be looking inward at what we can do to fix it. I don't think many musicians, I personally 
was not interested in hearing Madonna's information about the Kabbalah, personally. I know a lot of great Hebrew scientists were interested to know what she truly felt about it, but I don't think that's appropriate. When I want to know anything scientific, I usually don't go and ask rock stars. And I also don't give a shit who they think is a good president or which tree should be saved. If you wanted to save a tree, buy the forest. They're for sale. <laughs> um, you kind of answered this on the bus tour of America, but, but over the years, uh, have you had any weird pairings or you opened up for somebody that you look back today and it's totally ludicrous or, or the other way around? I don't believe in weird pairings. I, I, think that the, I think that the Hendrix monkeys thing was an absolutely brilliant thing. Because it, 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 there are two kinds. I would say that would be a good idea for a promoter. Because then you get the two separate worlds. Nobody knew that the monkeys weren't going to be able to make their... F you would think that the monkeys were doing Hendrix a favor, and they probably were. They were going to say, let's give this guy a favor. He's brilliant and everything. We did it for the who. It was the perfect pairing. Our audience, just like the Monkeys audience for Hendrix, were shouting, we want Herman. You know, until they stopped, until the Who became big enough that they would shout, we want the Who. You know, it's the way of show business. So all the pairings were odd. We were the oddest pairings on that first tour. You know, because we, when we became hot, we demanded to close the show. So we got to make on Georgia, and we went out, sta out stage to sing Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, and instantly wished we could sing Mrs. Lovely, You've Got a Brown Daughter. Because that audience was there to see Little Anthony. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that was an odd pairing. That would be tough. But we had The Who on a whole tour, and it was a wonderful thing, because, you know, they're friends of mine. They're still friends of mine. So the, the magical things that happened on the tour, it's like the New Jersey, you know, the home of sort of every brilliant rock critic in the world. This total wanker, who's now a famous rock critic, wrote, Herman's Hermits, The Who was so angry the girls were shouting, we want Herman, that the Who smashed up their equipment on stage. <laughs> I mean, it's great, isn't That's it? That's what caused it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they'd been doing it for five years. They'd never heard of Herman, so they are smashing up the gear. But those girls in Jersey at Asbury Park shouted, we want Herman. <laughs> I mean, it's great. And this guy became a famous rock critic. But me and Pete, no. <laughs> All right, last question. Uh, what's in the future for you? Are you going to continue touring? Just kind of, you know, it's hard to say. The f my future is I've never really had a plan. I just like to keep working. And I've managed to do that. Most people, I've had about 23 careers, you know, and I never know which one, which one was the most important. I like to think that the best thing I ever did was Herman Sermit, strangely enough, and that's going to be tough to beat because it's a good memory. Do you know what I mean? The, the, all this, every TV show that you've ever done keeps showing back up. But, you know, I listen to those Herman Sermits records on the radio and I'm kind of pretty proud of them. You know, they were music of, they were recordings of the moment. They fit with what was happening. You know, it was a bunch of lads who were having a great time. We went in the studio and we managed to make good records. And that's pretty good. You know, it's like, I'm sure people have made a movie, you know, like, like Jeff Bridges made a, a movie with his brother. You know, the Baker Bra Boys. That's his favorite movie. It's my favorite movie. It just happened to be one of those movies that didn't cost $300 million, wasn't, you know. It just is a great movie. It's a great moment. These two guys made this movie with the girl in it. I can't think of her name. It's a Michelle great movie. Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer. I think that Herman Summit sort of captured a bit of that energy that was going on at the time, which was, you know, we don't really know what we're doing. We're having a lot of fun and we have an idea. Would you share, is, share in this? And, you know, I'm Henry VIII, I am. It's hardly a world. There's nothing to, it's not, not about anything. But, you know, people still remember it with some sort of fondness. Yeah, it's a that's fun okay. song. Yeah. We made much better records than that, but that's the one that got famous. <laughs> Mrs. Brown and Lovely Daughter, Henry VIII, are not half as good, but they were recorded quicker than some of the songs that I think are better. If I'd have known that that record would still be around now, I would have spent more than three minutes in the studio recording it. That's funny. Can you think of anything, David? Well, no. I and, and three minutes, by the way, was we did it twice. Really? <laughs> did you do everything live at that time? Yeah. You're... Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. It was funny because we, the, the band, you know, the two background vocals were playing and coming up to my right. Ooh. 
lovely daughter. Really? Isn't that great? That's why you, the, the, the reverb is on everything. <laughs> Let's put some, uh, turn a bit more of that green knob there. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it's made. The Beatles did stuff like that. If you see the Beatles book, there's a fabulous Beatles book out. And there's, they had the four track thing in Abbey Road that we used as well. And there were, there were four faders. And in those days, the faders went, you know, clockwise yeah. and anti-clockwise. And each one of the Beatles has got their hand on a fader. And they're all on four. <laughs> <laughs> more drums, more bass, more guitar, and more me. <laughs> Did you record at Abbey Road? Yeah. You guys did, really? Oh, I, my Abbey Road stories are great. I used to see the Beatles there all the time, and I was dying to talk to them, you know. I had no idea what anything was about. There was a plate room. Plate room is, is where they have this steel plate where you make reverb. And I used to see them go in there all the time, and I go, what's that secret room in there? And I went in the plate room, and all, all over the floor were, like, bits of what looked like cigarettes all over the floor from the thing because because George wouldn't let them George Martin would let them smoke in the studio you know it was bad for the equipment mm -hmm. at the beginning <laughs> later on they were allowed to do whatever they wanted in there but at the time, so I go in this plate room and I'm going what's all this is in the door you know and I close the door so nobody knows what I'm doing what a strange room and there's a speaker in the corner which is where they would send the signal to the plate to make it reverb right so I'm standing there what's this I wonder what this speaker is and it suddenly goes hello and I'm, oh shit oh Somebody speaks through the speaker, you know, and I go, oh, and they go, who's in the playroom? <laughs> the Beatles found back. I was like, oh, crying. And I was a kid, so, and then I'd see, sometimes I'd go there and I'd see that, like, they would, I'd be doing my thing and they'd be doing their thing. There was a lot of, like, action around there when they were there. It's like the Beatles, you know. I said, John, what are you doing? Like an idiot. Hi, John, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you think we're doing? We're here to record you, idiot. <laughs> you know, why else would you be here? Oh, yeah, me too. I'm recording in number two. We're always in number one. Okay, can I come and listen to what you're doing? Mm, well, you know, we don't like this. Oh, just let me know what you're doing. So go in. And I think I figure they'll respect me much more if I'm critical, which is also a sign of stupidity. <laughs> I listen to her and I'm going, hmm. Do, do, do. So, yeah, it's great. You're not going to leave that. Boop, 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 boop. You're not going to leave that on, are you? He goes, I'm going to beat you up. And they actually physically like shook me and said, don't come in here like that. Oh, I'm sorry, I was just kidding. <laughs> you know, because it is dumb, isn't it? Suddenly in the middle of this record is boop, 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 Where did that come from? <laughs> Must have been Paul's like... Madonna? I don't know, I just, all I can remember is this See, sort of odd thing you? out of nowhere. Yeah, that's Lady Madonna. It's like odd like that in The Lion Sleeps Tonight. There's suddenly some woman singing opera in the background. You go, what is this? You must have run into the Hollies there too, right? Did no, they, they were never there at the same time. Oh, is that later? the most bizarre thing? No, they were, they were recording around, but we never saw them in the studio. Never. I guess we did The Graveyard. Herman's Hermits were... For example, if the Beatles wanted the Benson Echo Wreck and you had it in the room and you were right at the most important part of the mix, Somebody would come in and go, no, we just had... Oh. So the, the Hollies were much older than us and much brighter, so they probably never went in there when they couldn't get the equipment that they needed. We, was, we would just go... We would tour 300 days a year and go on our day off and make an album, you know what I mean? Oh, we got Thursday off, let's make an album. <laughs> True. That's amazing. Yeah. Our first album was made in three hours. The, Holly, the, the animals had three hours and they did theirs and we got there and we were like, they've gone five minutes into our three hours now, six minutes into our three hours. They made their album in three hours, introducing the animals and then we went in and did introducing Herman so it's three hours. You just played them. You played, you did your live show and right. then they mixed it. Remember in those days only two tracks so the mix was easy. Three so, tracks I think we got on the second album. Did you go and add background vocals, or what was the? No, we did everything live. We would we, we could mix down to one track again, and then add some background vocals and another guitar on later. But you would do it all in three hours, twelve songs, three hours. Wow. Yeah, it's good, great, great way to. But but remember, we all could play the songs when we got there. We didn't show up and have to learn the songs. Mm -hmm. These are our songs. Here's how we do them. You don't tell me, the de -de -de -de. I don't like the ending. Okay, we'll fade. <laughs> 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 like silhouettes, it's, it's, it's silhouettes. We've got a couple of like silhouettes. Was um, Jimmy Page was the guitar player on it, so 
when it comes, we're doing this and we're really, it's a really great feel. It started off really bad, you know. Took a walk and passed your house. I was the pianist, you see, so it was not very good because I wasn't a good pianist. And he goes, he comes, diddly, 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 which is his warm up. It's his, still to this day, that's his warm up. So he goes, hey, let's try this. So we do it all the way through, and the tape goes through the machine. You know, in those days, the tape just goes up, and we don't have any more tape. So the fade on the end of silhouettes goes, ah, and it's supposed to go, ah, ah, ah. It was our stage ending, but he goes, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> the end is the quickest fade in the history of show business. After that's another way home. There's no tape, it just stops. <laughs> ah, ah, as that goes through the thing. Couldn't do it again. He's not going to come back later. We're going to go and buy some tape. Can you come back in an hour? <laughs> he didn't. Do... Well, Jimmy, well, that was pre Yardbirds for him then, right? He was just he a session was, guy? Yeah, he was 12 pounds. Yeah. And Wonderful World, he does Wonderful World as well, plays great guitar on Wonderful World by Herman Solis. And John Paul Jones was on everything from then onwards. Oh, really? Yeah, he's the bass player on everything from about 1965 and did all those great arrangements, like No Milk Today and There's a Kind of Hush, did the string arrangements. They're a real genius. But we found him. You discovered him? Yeah, well, not discovered him. We saw that he was there and that he was definitely above average musician. Tried to get him to join the band, but the, my band, Herman Sermitz, wouldn't. We took him on one German tour and they said he's, ex he's not that good for a hundred pounds a night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he was brilliant. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was great fun. Oh, I could sit and talk all day long. I love all that old stuff.